Okay, we have to go straight on to the next panel, panel two, which is digital operations. How will the upstream oil and gas sector be transformed? That's a big topic, and to answer it is the moderator for this panel, Patrick Bangert, who is the VP AI, great job title, for Samsung SDS America. Patrick, are you there? Yes, hello. Good morning. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you might be. It's a pleasure to host the panel on digital operations. How will the upstream oil and gas sector be transformed? And we have five great panelists with us today. Uh, we'll start off with a brief introduction by um, each one of you, uh, Johan Nell, Julian Zek, uh, Botan Osman, Harald Wessenberg, and Neil McCrindle. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, um, I'm Johan Nell and I work with Bringa Partners. Uh, it's a firm that specializes in helping the energy industry, uh, including the oil and gas uh, sector, solve some of today's uh, strategic and operational challenges. Um, I personally work at that classic intersect between process or workflow, as it's otherwise known, and then how technology, specifically digital technologies, improve the value that our clients are trying to deliver and also uh, in today's world, help them position for the changes that our industry face. Thank you, moving on to Julia. I'll go next. I'll go, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, my name is Julian Zek. I am senior program manager at Maersk Drilling. Uh, working in oil and gas for a long time now, uh, working from OEMs or manufacturers to service providers now for drilling contractor, and uh, always have been working with innovation in the last eight years, focusing on performance and maintenance digitalization and improvements. What time? Hi, I'm uh, Botan Osman, um, CEO of uh, Restrata. Um, our focus has always been how to use uh, design and, and technology to keep people uh, and assets safer. Uh, our, our focus has been uh, through our Restrata platform is to provide the, uh, the operational visibility um, on, on where people are and how to maintain safety, whatever the risks are. Um, and, uh, and our platform has most recently um, uh, helped face uh, helped our clients face some of the challenges uh, recent challenges with COVID by helping them manage things like social distancing contact tracing onshore and and, and offshore in, in in various locations um, and most interestingly uh, I guess outside of the oil and gas world we've helped put on a number of international sports tournaments using our technology including the international sports tournament that took place for cricket in the UK with the England uh, cricket board so. So uh, our, our, our focus is how do you apply technology to kind of keep uh, keep people safe, and of course, uh, how do you digitize safety and uh, and, and mobility uh, moving forward? So I look forward to this uh, discussion. Harold. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Harold Westenberg. I work at Equinor, where I work with uh, software innovation. I've uh, been doing this for quite a lot of uh, years. I've uh, been um, working at the Equinor Research Center in uh, Trondheim in Norway for about 25 years uh, and deploying and developing technologies for, um, for the oil and gas industry. Uh, currently focusing on bringing technologies from being a good idea to being, uh, to being implementable across uh, Equinor. Go ahead, Neil. Hello, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Neil McCrindle. I'm a regional director here at Nasuni. Um, originally from Scotland, uh, but I now live in, in London in the UK. But um, I've been working with oil and gas operators and service providers for probably over 16 years now. Um, and that's been in a variety of different disciplines around 
cloud transformation, uh, data center, um, and software-defined projects. Um, so very pleased to be part of the, the panel today. Yeah, thank you all for being here. It looks like we have a great group lined up. And of course, we're talking about digital operations and transformation in the oil and gas sector. So let's start off with talking about what it is that this digital transformation, digital operations is, is supposed to provide to the oil and gas sector. Let's start with Neil and ask, what is the digital transformation from a vendor's point of view? Yeah, and, and thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's a great question um, and a good starting point. Um, from our perspective, I think everyone has a different view on what digital transformation means. And that, that's a term that is used very broadly um, and it, it means different things to different people. So I guess from, from our perspective as a vendor, uh, we quite often see it being banded around by other vendors um, and, and it's quite often been used in a convenient way to, uh, as an excuse for, for vendors to, to probably sell you more of, of what you've already have, <laughs> maybe with a slightly different twist to it. Um, so when I, when I think about uh, digital transformation, I think the clue is really in the name. It's about how do we uh, enable embrace technologies to have to, to achieve the business outcomes that they want to, that we want to deliver. So, you know, the, 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 the clues in the word transformation, it's not just a, a, an improvement, it's, it's something that has a fundamental difference to the, to the business outcomes that the oil and gas companies, you know, want to actually achieve. So I think we really have to measure it on those terms. Um, from our perspective, you know, from the Sunni's perspective, um, we do see that I think a lot of this it starts out on what it what is it that we actually want to achieve because we can't transform something until we have real clarity on what it is that we're actually trying to change um, and that could mean you know a number of different things in, in oil and gas it could be the drive for you know better operational efficiency improved productivity in our in our world it, it often means things like better access to data being able to embrace cloud technologies and analytics uh, in a better way. So I think it can mean a, a number of different things, but I think, you know, when I go out and talk to customers, and unfortunately I've not done much of that this year because of, of COVID obviously, uh, as we all have, but when we look at the, the industry in general, it's gone through a lot of change with, not just with COVID, but obviously with the low oil prices, um, geopolitical influences, and I think, Overall, you know that's that's been a positive thing for for transformation because it's it's driven innovation. It's it, in a, in a sense it's it's probably forced innovation in a lot of ways, perhaps sooner than maybe some companies would uh, would have done it otherwise. And I think that's a big thing. But I think also it really starts with you know what is it that we're trying to achieve, and we always ask that question and and uh, from our perspective as a vendor to say what is it that, that, that businesses want to do and, and, and what is the, the right um, the steps that we need to go through in order to make that happen. Right. Thank you, Neil. So in order to transform, we have to know what we're transforming to. That's, uh, that's for sure. Thank you. Um, Johan, what uh, are the challenges of digital transformation in the oil and gas sector specifically? Patrick, I think there are multiple challenges um, for digital transformation in our sector. Um, and it kind of starts from some of the points that Neil makes around um, being seduced by various technologies. Uh, in, you know, a number of the previous speakers uh, earlier this morning called out um, uh, you know, a range of technologies that are now available out there that forms part of the you know the portfolio of, of of digital solution elements. But actually, I think you know one of the hardest things to do is the the willingness of our of of operators and others to invest in what I call the hard yards. I mean, digital digitization at its core is about fundamentally about access to data, um, supporting defined workflows across your business, collaborating 
around the data with those workflows and getting insight from the data. And each of those elements require significant investments or indeed just changes of or change of ways of working around data. You talk about data-driven decision making. And it's not easy to achieve those changes without real leadership commitment or indeed investment. There's a lot of really fundamentals that need to be addressed in order to progress along the digital maturity curve. And I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. You have to maintain your equipment hierarchies and document equipment histories and the performance of the, the equipment elements in a consistent way in order to learn from that data. And we would also, well, that's quite basic, but with so many assets changing hands and changing hands more frequently, this is not a given that you actually have that information. And making the effort and the time investment is where digitization often starts. So investing in those, you know, what I call the hard yards is, is one of the, the key challenges. I think another challenge is actually achieving value or or the, the lack of value achieved uh, around digital transformation in, of course, in a short enough cycle, especially in today's environment where, you know, funding and, and profits are under pressure. You know, the question, where's the money, is really a fundamental question for investing in digital. And, and as I said before, you have to invest to solve some of the basics. <clears throat> I don't think enough time is spent thinking through what are we trying to solve for? The question, what are we trying to solve for? I, what is the fundamental performance obstructions uh, to improve better data access and define uh, consistent workflows and use collaboration in order to solve those issues? So, you know, what are we trying to solve for? I think is a fundamental, is a fundamental question over and above the technologies available. And I'll give you another example. You know, if you want, most of the operators sets out with a aspiration to improve well planning cycles. And I guess the question is, what's holding you back? Access to data, lots of handovers in the process, lack of collaboration, tools and mechanisms to, to bring various skills uh, together around the data and make decisions. Well, if you know what you're solving for, for and what the issues are in the data workflow collaboration chain, then and you can address those individual blockers, that makes it a far more targeted approach for transformation and, and you can and shortens the road to, to business value. So understanding what you're trying to solve for and how to get to value quickly, um, I think uh, is, is imperative in order to, to um, move the digital transformation agenda forward. Right. Technology for technology's sake is not a good thing. Definitely. It's very important. What are we solving for? Um, supposing that we did that, um, Bhutan, what are your practical experiences of making the digital transformation happen in the fields that you've served? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great question. I, I guess just touching on um, what colleagues said, it, it, absolutely starting with the um, uh, purpose in, in mind at the end, it, it, it's at, at the beginning, is it, it, it's vital. And um, for us, it's all about how do you create a, a more um, accessible and digital environment when it comes to managing people's safety. That's the key thing that we believe. Um, uh, you know, that's where our key focus is, and, and that's the and one area that we think perhaps not enough. Uh, digitization has happened over the past um, over the past period. A lot, a lot has been focused in other areas, and that's why we've made that our mission. Um, in our experience, we've seen that um, uh, operators we've worked with have had a high level of fragmentation when it comes to managing people safety, and uh, having multiple systems that are accessible in a uh, in, in in unique ways, so that the data from uh, maybe one drilling site versus the data on one offshore field related to how, um, how, uh, how where people are and people's safety and even basic systems like mustering is, uh, is very disparate. And so you, in order to ask the question of how are my people doing, where are they, um, uh, an emergency has just taken place, how many people are safe right now, this type of um, actionable immediate insights where seconds matter 
um, is very difficult to access for most operators. And that's what we've made our mission for a number of years now. So in our practical experience, we've tried to make um, the, the Restrada platform, which we, which, which we built specifically for the energy and industrial sector, um, useful at every stage. Because ultimately, if too much time is spent figuring out how to uh, extract data from operations, um, we believe not enough time is spent on uh, actually making um, the system useful for the for people at all levels. So I'll give you a very simple example. We worked with a global operator in a, in a country in the Middle East um, where they had uh, people safety issues when they were transporting workers. So this is mobility, pick people up at the airport and, and transporting workers. And, and all of this data was stored somewhere. Um, they had sometimes manually, sometimes in spreadsheets, uh, but they weren't really able to fully get a picture of where is everybody right now if they were to ask the question, if there was an incident or an emergency. Uh, we helped them build, using our platform, build, a, you know, we had a, an app deployed for them that basically connected to their profile management system that where, where the app was used by the drivers themselves. It was very easy to use to basically tag people into a vehicle and tag people into site when they're moving around. But actually, you know, what um, to, 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 to mention what my, the, the, the previous speaker had said, you know, access to data was then, uh, was then solved. We then helped support the workflows that they had using the same app. And, and that immediately, uh, because it was on the same platform and it wasn't fragmented, fixed the collaborating uh, issue because now everybody can, can collaborate around this workflow. And if any decisions are made, that they can be that they can be made around the same data set. And then, of course, then getting insights from these areas as you as you run this type of process over over many months, you can then start to get data insights. So I think it's really important to think about, you know, from our perspective, what are you deploying at the field level, and what data is that collecting, and then how do you uh, combine that with what what is being collected by maybe sensors. And then how does that come in to be used on a day-to-day -day basis rather than just stored and then, and then with, with the intent to analyze sort of later? We've seen this challenge hit operators hard when it comes to COVID when it's not just about the last mile, it's about the last inch. And it's trying to work out who has been in contact with who and, and, and in which office and in which site and how do, we, how do we deal with a COVID case that might come up? And that's another example of you know, integrated data systems. And we saw that uh, clients who we worked with previously to, to understand where their people were on various sites um, benefited from, from being able to answer COVID questions much easier when it comes to things like contact tracing. So that's kind of been our practical experience. And we've tried to, it's about adding value at every level and making sure that, the, that, that it collects into a, to a wider workflow. And again, that, that's what digitization is really all about, uh, making it easy for the user to, to be part of the ecosystem uh, rather than just high level data um, sort of uh, crunching. Yeah, I can only emphasize that from my own perspective, the user experience of the, the person who is uh, in the end meant to change their life is, is crucial to this, not just uh, data and analysis. Um, specifically to, to drilling, Julian, what is the most important thing about digital transformation in the drilling? Okay, from, from our perspective, as a client to many digitalization suppliers, we every time emphasize that digital transformation for us is not just improvement of our efficiency or the things what we currently do and how we do the things. Digitalization is also a tool to change, to develop, to, to create a new operational strategy. It means how do we utilize our rigs, how do we utilize our tools, and how do we utilize our crews? And on the other side, how do we control also costs and risks? The thing is, what many times I am seeing in the in the in the meeting with the suppliers is that that uh, access is not always visible. It's not always easy to establish an access between a small, relatively small product or initiative and what we want to achieve and how that will be monetized. 
So th that is probably the pro issue is not only on the supplier side, the issue is probably on the both sides, it's communication. Because we are not very good to, as I can see, to express what we want. And then it's very difficult to build something which you don't know what it is. So I think we have a lot to do here to communicate better and to to be more clear what we are going to what we want to achieve but also from the supplier side i think uh, thinking business first and technology later is crucial in 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 these times uh, today yeah thank you for that um so harald we've we've heard uh a number of statements now about having to figure out what what are we solving for what's what's the problem where are we going uh, and of course all of this is a managerial uh, communication aspect um, in your experience how do we improve the collaboration between the the different uh, stakeholders especially between the office uh, workers and the offshore workers yes um <clears throat> Uh, Equinor or Statoil, as we used to be called uh, until a few years ago, we've been working on this digital transformation for for many many years. Uh, we called it integrated operations in the early two thousands. We've called it uh, digitalization now for the past, past couple of years. But at its core, it's about the same um, same efforts, and that is the effort to bring information to everyone that needs it. So we are collecting a lot of data in our offshore installations and then bringing that data onshore through high capacity fiber networks. Um, and, and that means that all the engineers and uh, the, the office workers onshore, they can access this data that was previously only available on the offshore installations. Uh, and that gives us uh, a number of benefits. Um, that that also uh, that we that we see um, one of them of course is the access to experts uh, we see that uh, by bringing all this information around we can have expert groups that you wouldn't be able to have on one particular installation but you can have an expert group that that follows several uh, several installations and can give good advice to the offshore workers that both reduces risk and also improves uh, safety uh, and of course, it saves money. Uh, it improves production and and um, all of the other things that oil operators are currently uh, focused on. And we also see that it um, <clears throat> gives us much better insight into what's um, what's going on deep inside the, the, the reservoirs. And and by bringing that insight uh, to the office workers, they can make better production forecast the uh, production plans and those production plans can then be uh, communicated back to the to the operators offshore and be used to to plan and and improve the, the operations yeah thank you for that um, so we've talked a little bit about what the digital transformation is and what some of the challenges are uh, let's talk a little bit about the status quo uh, where are we uh, in the transformation? Obviously, some companies are further along than others, but sort of globally, overall speaking, where where are we? Uh, Julian, uh, what's the driving force behind Maersk's uh, drilling transformation? Uh, in Maersk drilling, <clears throat> whatever we do, you know, it's, it's general for all industries probably. Whatever we do is to improve our competitive edge, meaning that we we try to utilize digitalization to improve us in four uh, strategic areas. It is improving our performance of our ships. It is uh, cutting down operational costs, uh, cutting down our env environmental footprint and improving our planning and logistics. So with that in mind, we have started uh, collecting data information from all our rigs, from all our ships. But in the current situation where we are, where we are both fighting uh, fierce competition and uh, low activity and low oil price, it is it is hard, uh, hard work to do. So uh, really our mostly our driving force is to 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 
invest in the into technology which can improve us in these four uh, areas so we are a long way uh, in each of them and uh, we collaborate we are open to collaborate with with all actors in this uh, uh, in this uh, ecosystem from the regulatory societies class societies uh, suppliers and operators uh, equally Okay, so the cutting edge uh, at Mary Sterling is the digitization. That's fantastic to hear. Um, Harald, moving on to you, what are some of the important lessons of providing the digital tools to the field workers themselves? I think uh, one of the most important lessons that we've learned is that for a digital tool, as with any tool, to be truly successful, it has to be suitable for uh, the people that are going to use it. Um, and over the years, we've built a lot of experience on, on how to build great tools for office workers. But uh, as we're now start, starting to build better tools for offshore workers, we see that understanding the nature of uh, how these tools are used when we bring them onto a tablet or a other portable device and, and making sure that um, that it actually works in connection with what they are doing is uh, is uh, very important. We had uh, a lot of experience with, uh, or we have a lot of experience with using variable sensors. But when you test the variable sensors in the labs, then very often they you use it alone, or maybe together with one or two uh, other sensors. But uh, as you go offshore and you see that it's used by scaffolding builders which has a lot of harnesses and bolts and, and hooks and ropes and everything then you see that it's very important that the, the digital tools uh, are properly designed for the purpose that they're being used for and uh, also um, that means that sometimes we have to take the step of uh, flying the off developers offshore put them on the installation um, and have them use their own tools. Uh, we did that for the digital field worker on Johan Svadlup, our digital flagship. Um, and uh, it was a very interesting experience to take these developers, fly them out to the, to the platform, uh, take them out to the middle of the, into the middle of the processing plant and give them their tablet with their tools on and a set of tasks and ask them to solve it you, with the protective um, equipment, with the, the gloves, with the glasses, with the radios, everything. That, that taught the developers a lot about how their tools were going to be used um, in real life. And also that discussion with the end users uh, gave us a much, much better tool uh, when, we, when we deployed it uh, a few months later. Uh, also, I think it's important that we understand the true nature of, um, of what we're trying to solve. Uh, there is a, <clears throat> a, a, an old story going around in the, in the Norwegian uh, offshore community about a workshop where a number of uh, sea captains were in, invited to, to discuss unmanned ships. Um, and the, the premise of the conversation was that uh, if you didn't have to navigate, you didn't have to have personnel on board. But it turned out quite rapidly within the, the workshop that uh, navigation and, and uh, actually steering the ship is very little of what uh, the, the crew does. Mostly what they do is painting and uh, maintenance. And uh, there is no amount of, uh, of digitalization that can, can replace that unless you start to get into robotics and, and so on and so on. But better navigation and control systems are not going to take away your uh, needs for for painting and and so on and and that knowing what you're solving is a big thing because a lot of the onshore stakeholders their experience um, is a bit outdated sometimes um, and that means that you have to be sure that you're actually solving what you're trying to solve. Uh, thank you. I, I think this is a, a really really great idea. Uh, you know, gather the user experience turned around upside down, get your developers, your technology developers, some field experience so that they can see what's going on. I, I've seen some, some good results having done that. 
myself before. So that's that's awesome. Practical recommendation to all the tools developers out there. Um, moving on to Botan, um, what are your top lessons learned from your project so far? Uh, Patrick, thanks. And I just, yeah, I guess um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, mention a, a few. I'll just echo what Harold just mentioned. I think it's an absolutely vital um, element. And, and, and we uh, have a set of, I mean, we're, in our company, we have a combination of operators who uh, run and manage uh, emergency response centers, one of which is in Aberdeen uh, that, 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 that serves the uh, offshore community with, with incident and emergency response. Uh, we, we also have field workers, trainers, etc. So we have a services element and, and obviously an engineering and technology and product development element. And, and one of the biggest lessons, I think Harold just mentioned it, that we've learned is we get much better results when we put these two groups together. Uh, you know, whether it's our product managers, our hardware engineers, our software engineers, uh, with the operational specialists, so that once the tool is developed, it's not about handover and training, it's a tool that they recognize. So uh, one example that I'll give is, is when, we, when we designed our emergency response and mustering tool, sort of the software tool that helps manage that, um, the first few iterations were actually totally rejected by the guys who run our incident response room because they said, well, I can't use this in an emergency. It has to be a lot more intuitive for me to be able to, to get my answers in a few seconds and, and, and I'd rather write it on a whiteboard. And so and, and we had the, the developers working directly with them. And of course, we then brought in a number of areas. So that, that collaboration is vital, I think, it's because the environments that, that our end users work in are complex, uh, they're difficult, and they're pressure bound. So uh, that, that one is definitely a, a major lesson uh, that, that we've learned. And now we continue to apply that in every bit of product development that we do. Um, and, and now we're fortunate to have a number of clients with us. So, so we, we include their operators too, as we're, as we're working through our future iterations of the roadmap. Lesson two for us is that definitely the vision that we have around digitizing safety across multiple sites um uh, is uh, you know is what we go into the client with however not one size fits all in terms of the maturity especially of various sites so so we work on some some of the client sites where they have fantastic connectivity they have uh, hardware on the ground already pre-installed people um you know uh, sort of location-based data on the ground that we can integrate with um so so that 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 connects well but you can't find that everywhere and so we work with other sites, of course, that have actually nothing, um, maybe a drilling site on an onshore uh, uh, field out in the Middle East, for example, which, which at the moment has nothing and therefore becomes a blind spot. And so, and so what, we've, uh, what we've tried to do is sort of create uh, solutions that can not only uh, apply to the very high-tech, high, highly connected sites, but also you know, removing unique blind spots, putting in very simple um, sort of apps for access control and apps for mustering and other things in order to also get the data from the blind spots because the people that are working in those non-connected environments are just as vital for, for a company's safety as, as the people that are working in sort of non-connected environments. And I think the, the final lesson that we've learned is infrastructure is never easy. So the, the software, may, may, and I think it's, again, echoes Harold's point, may work fantastic in the lab, but until you kind of road test it uh, with the infrastructure specific to the client, um, we you know we found soft launches are always a great uh, you know a, a great tool within a project lifecycle to make sure that any infrastructure issues are ironed out. Um, and then of course keeping keeping people involved along the way. So so yeah, three three key lessons really for us as we deploy with with oil and gas clients in different in different countries. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, moving on from that same vein, Johan, what would be your advice to an operator going through a digital transformation? Uh, Patrick, yeah, I think my advice is actually relatively straightforward and, and really links to what Julian said about um, efficiency versus operate, opportunity or, or perhaps change in, 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 in the way of ways of working or um, let's call it operating model. Um, I think for every operator, I think the, it's important to identify for their specific business circumstances and 
priority areas or functions within that business, where they think the value or opportunity is being lost, lost through lack of insight or inefficient workflows. Um, I think operators all find themselves in different business cycles. Each operator have different strengths um, and have assets with different characteristics. Um, and so therefore, making it quite specific to the challenges or the opportunities that, that each operator sees for themselves within their circumstances is really important. And then I think the cycle that I, that I think I described and I think is starting to emerge out of this conversation uh, through the comments of, of, of some others um, really applies. So, you know, I repeated just for, for clarity, in what are the outcomes that we are trying to achieve within each of those functions or areas of opportunity? What is holding us back from a data workflow or process, collaboration and data insights perspective? What can't we do at the moment with the tools, technologies and data that we have? And then out of all of the range of opportunity out there through vendors, um, uh, both specialist and more general vendors in this space, which digital components will actually address each of these blockers and line them up against for, the, for each specific area or blocker so that you in the end end up with a, a set of components that will address or build that, that digital capability or, or digital transformation we're looking for. Now, often when you go through each function uh, you know, or area of opportunity, you find out there's a lot of commonality in the challenge. The, the, the commonalities lie around data, it, it lies around collaboration, it lies around applying uh, AI and other data insight uh, uh, technologies or, or techniques. And so therefore you can build within a company, you can build an enduring capability whereby there's a base capability around data access, collaboration, and data insights that can be applied to various functions. I absolutely recognize that, you know, that our industry needs, in, sometimes needs inspiration, um, having been so used to doing things in a specific way for a long time. Um, and so therefore being exposed to, to technologies from vendors um, and other industries actually is really helpful. And of course, these conferences where we get to see some of the interesting things that that others are doing, Shal Petronas and others earlier this morning, does help to get a bit of that, that inspiration. But um, my mantra really around how to, how to progress a digital transformation in an enduring way, something that you know, leaves behind a change in ways of working and sets you up for the future, is really to focus on the areas that will address value, seek the common elements, out of all of that regarding data collaboration and data insights you know and line these up in a in a in a sort of staircase of capability that will that will deliver as i say enduring change for your business yeah thank you johan definitely the different pieces have to fit together into a coherent big picture um, speaking of the pieces neil what are some of the software applications that underpin the digital transformation Sure. So I think the the answer to that question probably starts again with you know what what are the the challenges that we're trying to we're trying to solve and I think from our perspective one of the biggest things that we've seen in oil and gas in general and one of the biggest changes has been that oil and gas has always been an industry that has a lot of sites it's a it's heavily distributed many you know many companies have in you know, 40, 50, in some cases, hundreds of sites. Um, and they have a lot of data, they have a lot of file data. Um, and as a result of that, in the old world, when we look at infrastructure and software um, approaches to try to manage all that, is a lot of, a lot of um, operators have always bought infrastructure um, for that individual site. So therefore, we've grown up in this world of silos, of data silos. And I think what's, what's now changing and what, you know, the big, the big issue there is obviously that we all know that in data silos, it's very difficult to collaborate on data. You've heard a number of the panelists talk about the need for collaboration, the need to 
to be able to share and access our data more effectively. And under that distributed world, it's been very difficult to do that because we have large files, we have limited network, we have limited bandwidth, and it's very, very hard. So I think one of the biggest things is how, as a starting point, um, before I can drop in my analytics tools and, and a lot of the other clever stuff, um, how do I make sure that I've got a, a data platform that is accessible? And how can I eliminate some of those silos and some of those constraints that the old world has, uh, has, has given us? Um, and moving into the new world. So I think what we're now seeing as uh, new technologies and, and, and software to do that are obviously there's greater use of the cloud, um, there's greater use of tools that allow us to consolidate those large data sets, those seismic data sets, whether it be from, from Slumberger or, or others, and give us the ability to access that data, maintain performance for the users, for those users themselves. And that means that I've now got an infrastructure where I can now collaborate on that data more effectively. But from an operator's perspective, I can make decisions faster because what I can now do is, if everyone has access to that same data pool, I can now leverage a global resource base. Um, so we have geologists all over the world. How do we make sure that you know we? we give them the appropriate access to that to make faster decisions, right? Which ultimately will lead to, um, you know, reduced seismic interpretation times. It means that uh, there's a reduced time to oil, all these different things. So I think that has to be the um, one of the first steps is how can I create a platform that gives me that? And then I think as a second point, it might be around how do we um, use analytics tools or that allow us to to make better decisions on that data once we've centralized it, once we once it's accessible, once we've set up that building block, that platform, as it were. Um, and I think the other change, and we see that a lot when we're you know customers are looking to embrace cloud technologies and and the various benefits that that gives them. And I think from an operational point of view, um, there's always that cost predictability. There's being able to move to a model that allows me to scale on demand, to, to flex on demand, whether that be compute infrastructure applications, just a more dynamic model. And the, the question I always ask is, why do we need a more dynamic model? And I think you know that's that's clear with all the prevailing wind, you know, the the wind the winds of change that are going through the oil and gas industry, and all the the headwinds really that we're that we're all facing is is just accelerated that. So I think it's a combination of of different strategies um, that allow us to uh, to get better access to data. Thank you for that. Um, we have had a couple of questions from the audience, and Stuart is going to help us out with what they are. Yes. Hi, Patrick, and hi, uh, panel. Great discussion, and uh, we've had a couple of really good questions that I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to answer. So. I guess, Patrick, I'll hand these to you and then you can distribute as you see fit. Uh, and we've only got seven minutes left. So just a reminder to the panel, seven minutes. Uh, first question from John Glenn. Uh, will the current set of external factors resulting from pandemic and energy transition pressures accelerate digitiz the digitization and broader transformation in oil and gas? Question mark. Have we now reached a real tipping point, the great reset? Or is it broadly business as usual? That's the first question. Second question from Ian Elcote. Curious as to how successful the deployment of handheld devices and tablets has been across assets, especially in environments where the end user is wearing gloves and protective equipment. We have seen several initiatives for managing joint integrity, having mixed take up offshore. Okay, over to you. Uh, yeah, Johan, do you want to answer the, uh, how does COVID affect transformation? Yeah, I think um, what's interesting is uh, over the last six, nine months, what we've seen from, from our clients are initially in the first period of this, there was a real hesitation, especially when the oil price uh, um, you know, dropped so significantly. But more recently, um, what we've seen is a lot of our clients really think through how they reposition themselves for the future. And there is definitely some acceleration um, in, in the deploying but, I, but, I, but where I do think the change is, uh, it's getting more specific and more precise. 
as to where they deploy digital solutions in order to a position a improve their business as it is today and position them for the future and of course the whole, the whole issue of energy transition uh, net zero and so forth has become about a, a, a much bigger topic an accelerated topic over the last few months um, due, due to the pandemic but also uh, some other factors so I would say yes we have uh, we have reached a, a tipping point but I do think our clients are thinking more carefully about where they spend and trying to get quite specific value out of their spend. Um, Bhutan, do you want to take the uh, tablets distribution question? Yeah, absolutely sure. Um, so, so really good point. And I think it goes back to the original discussion that we had around user experience. So. Uh, it's it's no good uh, putting a, a a tool out there for somebody who needs to press lots of buttons, who's potentially wearing a glove. Um, we we've developed a couple of touchless experiences. So, for example, one of the apps we've got doesn't require the uh, you know comes on when the when the tablet comes on using MDM doesn't require the user to do anything. Uh, it, it's it's used for example to scan in um, ID cards using a digital mustering incident, for example, or uh, we have other uh, other apps that are designed to kind of um, you know not not be interacted with via the uh, via the screen itself, but maybe some hard buttons, uh, volume up, volume down, to do certain actions. So, but it all goes down to where is this piece of technology that you're using going to be used by who and under what conditions? And you've got to field test it in that environment. It goes back again to what Harold said around field testing. It's so important because we've got. Uh, more and more areas that are that are of um, you know that are challenging more than any other industry. I would say. I think internet connectivity is also something that's absolutely vital to think about. So the lab that is connected to fiber is very different to an offshore platform that has um, you know low latency, very high latency, and also uh, low bandwidth. So everything that you develop has is, is got to be with the field with the field in mind, um, and that's uh, that's how those challenges can be can be overcome. Okay, great. Thank you. And actually, there's a third question come in, uh, Patrick, from Abdullah. Uh, I think it's Abdullah I is, is all I can see here. Um, what is your opinion on the adaptability of digital transformation in the GCC, particularly Saudi Arabia, in the private sector, given their huge role to play in the global oil and gas sector, yet conservative in terms of operations? So GCC, Middle East region, are they behind or ahead of the curve? Julian, do you want to take that one? The Middle East is mostly land um, operations, but I think from my period, from my previous positions, you know, that uh, whatever is going on now in the Middle East is uh, improving also rapidly. You know, there are huge investments from uh, from manufacturers to establish production in uh, in the Middle East. The second thing is that the laws and regulations in the Middle East are being adapted <clears throat> to to transform the industry and to to also transform how uh, the industry works within within the Saudi Arabia and uh, the Emirates. And uh, the last thing is that. Uh, if you look into the the big projects the in the last couple of years if you look who orders the ships who orders the rigs who orders the modern technology everything comes from the middle east so i think there is a great potential there not for us as a drilling contractor uh, offshore but uh, industry will uh, survive there and industry will improve there uh, in that region because the oil and gas is crucial for, for the Middle East. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we're almost out of time, so it's uh, my turn to say thank you very much to all the panelists for taking out their time and being here with their experience. Of course, thank you to the audience for listening to us. And I think I speak for all the panelists when I say please reach out to us. Uh, we would have loved to be there with you in person for a conference like this, but we can't for obvious reasons. Um, everyone on the panel is on LinkedIn. If you want to reach out to us, if you want to ask a direct one-on-one -on -one question, 
you can please do that um, via the, the LinkedIn channel. So thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Patrick. Uh, very well moderated and another very interesting panel. Um, I actually think there was a topic that came up in that that um, needs further discussion later, which was how there are so many assets changing hands right now. And that's the real challenge for digital transformation. I, I think kind of is that actually one of the key reasons that digital is slow is that owners know their assets might be sold and therefore don't want to start the digital journey. Good question. Something to think about for later. Really like the discussion also around this your transition you start from where you are and it is the transition actually is a personal journey for every individual and every business and everybody starts from a different place and therefore will also end up in a different place